Let's take a deeper look and build a foundation for our discussion. Of course, we did that, but we want to look at the numbers. For starters, the numerical strength of the Boda Boda sector. So far, we have 1.2 million, there are about riders in Kenya, and 1.08 of those are commercially, you know, driven. They ride to make money. And this sector actually supports over 6 million livelihoods, employing 75% youths, that is, of the 100% in the sector, 75% are youth between 18 and 35 years and 6% are females. Let's talk revenue generation, which is very important. How much money is the sector making? On average, a rider makes a thousand shillings a day. That you translate generally based on the number, which is on average a, a million border border riders, that is a billion shillings a day. So annually that adds up to 365 billion shillings annually. That is money circulating in the sector. Now, how does the government benefit from this? This is in terms of, uh, first of all, consumption by this sector, where on average, an individual rider consumes close to 300 shillings of fuel a day. That translates to 300 million shillings daily worth of fuel being consumed by this sector. And from that, on matters taxes, levies, and other charges, the government gets 163 billion shillings daily. So, the crackdown by our president, Uhuru Kenyatta, what does it say? First of all, smart licenses, licensing. Let's get our licensing in order in this sector. Then, the players have to join a registered circle. And in this circle, they have to have a digital register for easy identification of members. So in case anything happens, provide your pass, which circle do you belong to? Can we verify that through digital means? Well, that should take a maximum of 60 days or should be done within that uh, time span. And that's why I want to bring in our EPO panelist, Ken. I mean, looking at the numbers, two million, okay, one million on average, yeah? But it's going 1.2, commercially 1.08 million. That is quite a huge number when you talk about employment in the country. This sector is quite, uh, is quite vibrant and also a huge chunk of the employment, you know, numbers of the SME sector lies in this sector. Am I wrong? You're absolutely right, and it's unfortunately so. Uh, about five years ago, um, on this very show, um, I told uh, one of your predecessors, uh, Malika Kazia, that in the next five years, if we don't get our economic policies right, our young men who should be engineers will be border border riders. Our young women who should be uh, running supermarkets will be, in wait will be waitresses. So this is actually a fruition of that, that we've had policies that don't create jobs. And now we have this huge population to deal with. So I think right now the most important thing is we have to accept it, the nature it is, and now we have to be able to treat it as a sector because it's putting food on the table for many livelihoods, it's supporting many families, and we can't wish it away. When I spoke to my Boda, the Boda Boda in our neighborhood, I asked him, how is he coping? And he said he's traveling, he's delivering by foot in this hot sun. So you can see it's, a, it's, 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 it's incredible suffering going through those people. And our policy makers need to understand that these are the SMEs mm -hmm. that we talk about. These are the small, medium enterprises. And the same level of uh, courtesy and respect to extend to the big business, we need to have policies that really speak to small business. Definitely. And when the president was making this remark, Mr. Ndoho, mm -hmm. I mean, I listened to him in totality. He mentioned, yes, we'll have a crackdown. But at the same time, uh, we have the risk of politicization of the whole situation. And he says that, uh, I mean, they acknowledge this sector has been so important, especially to create employment for our young folks. Uh, it's been one of the pioneering sector in terms of digital transformation in this, in this country. But at the same time, there is that fine balance of, of self-regulation which has not been tight enough, and now government oversight. In terms of the way we've seen the inroad of the government 
in, in the past few days. Uh, do you think the approach is right and is set to bear fruit within 60 days, as the president puts it? Well, um, there's a saying that says that uh, one should never let a good crisis go to waste. And I think what's happened here is this incident, in a sense, has become the trigger to finally formalize what has been an informal sector. I think the way it's grown, it's, it's grown to such a, a size that it needed some sort of uh, organization. And I think what the president has cleverly done is said, okay, now the public opinion is fairly much driven to one direction. It's time to formalize it. A couple of other things that, that come out very clearly about this. When it grows to the size it has, on average in economics, we talk about the multiplier effect. So if it's 400 billion a year, if you multiply that by four, you're talking about maybe a trillion, a trillion and a half in terms of economic impact in the, in the economy. Mm -hmm. So it's become too big for it to just continue informally. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, we are not surprised. The only thing I'll be, I'll be, I'll be concerned about is if it's overly um, aggressive, if the government is overly aggressive, because this is a, a very volatile uh, population. Mm -hmm. And in the season we are in right now, uh, it's going, this is probably going to be one of the best seasons in terms of, uh, of uh, re revenue generation. Mm -hmm. And so to that extent, uh, a more nuanced approach I think is important, but uh, it was inevitable when it's that big a, a sector that it would need a lot more, a lot more um, regulation. One last thing I'd say though, it's even as you're cracking down on the border borders, I'd very strongly also propose mm -hmm. that you crack down on the police. Do right. rent seeking because because what's going to happen now is you know whenever the government cracks down on something, it happens it becomes a a free fall for rent seeking by, by policemen. Yeah. What I mean by rent seeking, of course, is you know, corruption and asking for bribes. Well, suddenly that becomes another side side industry to what is actually a good intention of regulating the, the sector. Yeah. So you're turning <coughs> people's side hustle. Some of the people in the border border sector that is their side hustle into someone else's side hustle. <laughs> Very important. But I'm told Ramogi is with us. Uh, Mr. Ramogi, welcome to the show. Um, the last time we had a chat, you were stuck somewhere at DOD. But I'm glad the defense system they have opened up, and you're with us today. Um, uh, you know, there's there's the risk of 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 politicization, as I noted earlier on. Now, when, when you pay attention at the rhetoric that was ongoing when this particular situation after the forest road incidents, uh, we saw the Interior Cabinet Secretary saying the reforms had started, but some people hijacked it politically, and we are in a political year. Do you think the way we shape our policies in terms of reshaping even the small and medium-sized enterprises sector has a huge risk of, of being carried by the political wave and after the political season is just dumped and done away with, there's no level of consistency. Mr. Ramogi. I, I certainly hope not. And thank you for, uh, for, uh, for recognizing that I'm in the house. I certainly hope not that this will be uh, discarded after the electioneering period. I mean, as uh, some of my colleagues have mentioned there, I got the conversation midway. Uh, the sector is huge, employing thousands upon thousands of young people. And these young people have votes. So it's only expected that there will be some politics around the border border sector. There will be some politics around the Matatu sector uh, because of the large population of young people with votes that are present in these areas or in this sector. Um, but now beyond that, in terms of regulation, should we then have this conversation uh, with the political lens that we are having it with right now, I, th I think not. Uh, these are some very vital uh, seg seg sectors of the economy that we need to have an honest conversation about. Mm -hmm. The contribution is immense. Uh, if you ask me personally, I the conversation should move towards the values, uh, the national values we have as a country uh, that drives the behavior, the gang mentality we are seeing in the border border sector and in the Matatu sector. Mm -hmm. But moving forward, economically speaking, I think it's a great opportunity to, for us to manufacture border borders in, in the country. Um, I don't know why we are not having that conversation as yet, because I think it's a great opportunity uh, for, for the local uh, market and the regional market. Yes, definitely. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because the multiplier effect that uh, Mr. Horondoho mentioned, uh, we've been doing assembling 
of totally knock down you know border borders and uh, we saw this when we had a, a shift in taxation of these parts uh, but the president also mentioned that he said that uh, you know we've made border borders affordable right now a border border costs from 65,000 to about 130,000 Kenyan shillings which is quite affordable and you are seeing young people uh, entering into it quite quite quickly so some of these reforms uh, Mr. Gishinga join a circle okay we understand the boom of the circle, especially amidst the, the COVID-19 period. Mm -hmm. Some of these reforms that the president suggests, how do you assess them and uh, how viable are them? Are they to, to reshape the border border sector? Um, obviously, the need to be part of a community is not only good for the riders themselves, but good for the industry in terms of whether it's uh, regulation or self-regulation. And you've seen a bit of that in the Matatu sector. Um, I think uh, the challenge you run into, though, is uh, the fact that uh, the numbers that are coming into this sector are quite significant. And I think policymakers need to step a bit back and ask, this is a bit abnormal. You know, a few years ago, we didn't have this whole border border craze. So people have to ask, you know, how did we get to a place where left, right and center you're being overtaken by the border border. So I think there's an economic question on youth unemployment that has to be unpacked. And if you don't resolve it, you see like Lagos, for example, they just decided to do away with border borders, but they have tuk-tuks mm -hmm. that flood the city. Uh, but I think unless we go deeper to ask about the economics that makes this youth unemployment so high, mm -hmm. we will continue to talk about the level of regulation mm -hmm. that needs to happen at the circles. But I think it's a fundamental question of are we of the people with the right skills, why are they not in the careers that they need to be in the first place? Uh, well, horror. I mean, are we tackling this superficially? We are not is there an underlying issue or this is just a sector that has is there and will be there? Well, there's definitely a, um, a underlying issues that my colleague has mentioned. I would say, though, that it, much as it's a symptom of a problem, mm -hmm. it's also uh, a solution to a problem that's existed for a long time. And that's basically the phenomenon that when you leave school, there was a trajectory to work, you know, get employment, but clearly we've turned that whole model on its head. So most young people go out thinking, how can I make a living for myself? And to that extent, it means a phenomenon of uh, border borders is a reflection of that. Mm -hmm. People need to be self-employed. And I'll actually take the view that whatever gaps there may be in policies, how do you redirect this towards more value addition? I like uh, Amuki's idea about uh, manufacture here. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say, okay, you said it's, it's uh, in, in uh, circles for border borders, but then I imagine you then you move to the whole question of credit support. When you have circles and they're collecting money every day, that's a whole financial uh, uh, the dynamic that can create opportunities for them to diversify beyond circles. Mm -hmm. So the issue of policy, I'd say, is what other value additions are going to come along this chain? And in fact, one of the things I would really be keen on hearing about is a total master plan of, of the value proposition from Boda Boda. How do you start as a Boda Boda, end up in manufacturing, start up as a Boda Boda, end up in assembly, in manufacturing, um, uh, financial services. There are many other, it's, you go through the door called Boda Boda, mm -hmm. but if, for example, there are a good number of our Boda Bodas are graduates. Yeah, okay, now they have got a way of generating income. How do you use this as a model to then make it a springboard to even go back and do engineering mm -hmm. or other things? Yes. That oversight, that master plan of a policy, and as well, I don't see the imagination in. I don't know I don't, I don't what you think. Or uh, more of that sort of idea to, to, to um, get them to you know, add, add new things to this. Okay, now that the vehicle called Bola are there, yes. and clearly they're essential to our, our digital economy. Mm -hmm. Find ways now to make that a springboard for other things. In fact, that question you can throw to Ramogi. Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, Mr. Sure. Ramogi, I know you're listening in. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, I, you know, Wohoro is my senior, and he has uh, set the stage for uh, professionals asking the questions instead of giving the answers. Uh, uh, and perhaps I could add to the list of the questions uh, in terms of have we really uh, collected sufficient data around uh, the border border industry? Do we know who exactly is there? Because it's mentioned that there are in fact some graduates there. Mm -hmm. But what I know especially about value addition around the border border industry, I think it's huge. 
because you see uh, there is the passenger transport uh, business, but there's also the last mile delivery of goods, whether it's Jumia or any other e-commerce platform, border borders really deliver. But even now, uh, I know those, those um, these fundies or mechanics who make cars get their deliveries of parts from the border borders. And so the value addition is huge. Right now, Safaricom and KCB have gone into a partnership around the circles for border borders, and they are saving every day, and you know that savings can translate into investments. The country needs more savings as it is. So the financial sector um, around border borders is already deepening. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there are opportunities around it, but as my colleague was trying to allude, the data is very limited, and it would be very nice if we can have more studies around the sector. Yeah, that, that would be very important. Uh, Ken, uh, you're very passionate about data, I'm meant to understand. Well, well, not quite, but I think uh, Ohoro needs a bit, uh, I think we need to be a bit more candid. Yes. I think there are two ways of solving a problem. Um, Ohoro's approach is the incremental, let's accept life as it is. Mm -hmm. If you live in a slum, let's try and make your slum better. But there's a fundamental school of thought that says, no, you shouldn't be a slum in the first place. You've worked hard in university. You've earned your engineering degree. You need to be in a proper house. Hmm. So I think there's a risk of policymakers falling into what war is proposing, saying you're in a border border, let's think of value addition. Mm -hmm. But no, there's a fundamental reason of, if you were in another country, you would be working for a tech company. Mm -hmm. So I think we need a more breathtaking uh, <laughs> approach to policy making, and I think Ohoro is too much in the system yeah. to be able to, 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 to advocate for that. Ohoro, you're part of the system, <laughs> we see. Man of reply. <laughs> now, okay, okay, maybe it's a function of age also, but it's, and, and, and I, take it, I, I, take, I take your point. It doesn't have to be an either or, uh -huh. right? What I'm saying is that, you know, you get a stage in life, you say, okay, what's he in front of you? Start with that. At least okay. you can fix it. Even as you're doing other things, because I don't think we've stopped doing the other things. Yes. But I'm saying right now, I think this huge boil has now been lanced. Mm -hmm. Now you're having a conversation about how, what do we do with it. Yes. One thing we can't do is we can't imagine it away. Mm -hmm. Now, with that group, and if there are 1.8 million of, of them, what do you do with them now? And what I'm saying, what you plan to do with them now must be imaginative. Mm -hmm. But of course, it doesn't, it doesn't mean it is, um, it's uh, mutually exclusive. It, you can do that even as you're following the engineering. I'll be very, I'll be very interested from Ramogi's point. How do you, for example, among those uh, graduates, how many, among those border borders, how many of them are graduates? Mm -hmm. To your point, maybe you should go to them and say, okay, at least you have a springboard of some re revenue. Here's a policy around how we can go back to engineering but now you've got some sense of a business, running a business, right? Mm -hmm. I think they'll be far more successful because they've actually been in, a, in, a, in the wear and tear of, of, of a business, running a small business. Yes. But as I said again, yeah, I think it's, I suppose it's right. I'm more cautionary about that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's complimentary a, at the end of the right, day. Yes, that's all right. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, gentlemen, time is really running out. I know, uh, Mr. Amogi, I, I know in your head you're like, give me a right of response. I haven't called you part of the system, but what's your response briefly? Is, are these two mutually exclusive or complementary briefly as we finish up? Um, Ken Gishinga is treating the border border industry as if it's a problem, a disease that needs to be exterminated once and for all. No, it's not. It's an opportunity. It's an investment. It's a job. It's, it's a whole industry. We cannot exterminate it or deal with it once and for all. I think the approach of incremental uh, reforms is necessary. What we are looking at is not an economic problem, rather an economic opportunity. What we are looking at is probably a behavioral problem. A behavioral problem, you attack it incrementally using the broken window phenomenon, where you fix the window and you hope that the others will see that the window is fixed and fix uh, pa certain parts of their behaviors. And so uh, on this, I think I'm with Wahoro all the way. Let's, let's fix what we can do uh, as, as we build into the industry and increase the value addition. All right, Ken Gishinga, the tables have been turned on you. <laughs> You've called them part of the system, but at the end as we close up, you are the system. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. Ken Gishinga, Chief Economist, Mentoria, Wahoro Ndoho, CEO, Sandbox Capital.
and Ramogi Odhiambo, CEO, Elim, rather MD, Elim Capital. Gentlemen, thank you for your input. We take a short break right here on Business Today. When you come back, we have BBC Money Daily and thereafter some interesting stories from the world of business. Stay tuned.